Criminal Jury Selection Secrets for Self-Defense. Hi, I'm Jeff Hampton with Hampton Criminal Defense Attorneys. Today I want to talk to you about jury selection and the importance. Maybe you're charged with a violent crime. Maybe you're an attorney and you're trying to prepare for representing someone with a violent crime. And now you're trying to figure out, wait a minute, how am I going to make sure and take care of things to show that this individual acted in self-defense? Maybe you're innocent. Maybe you didn't do anything wrong and all you did is act in self-defense. How do you help the jury believe you acted in self-defense? Now, here's the way we do this. On our jury selection series, I've spent some time and I'm creating multiple videos talking about jury selection. We've talked about this already, that jury selection very much is one of the most important, and I believe in many ways, the most important part of the criminal trial. And one of the reasons why is because you get to talk to the people who are going to judge you. You get to find out Everything you want in a very short period of time, if you ask the right questions, you can unlock the secrets to their mind. You can find out how they see things, the way they look at things, and I don't care how persuasive you are, you can stand up and you can literally give the best oratory speech, you can get up and give the best presentation you can in your entire life, but if people are looking at it through a particular uh, lens that is already predetermined about how they're going to see evidence, it won't matter how good you are. So really, it's super important. The best criminal defense attorneys do a very thorough job, and they do a good job of listening to what the jurors, prospective jurors, are going to say so that they can make sure that, they're, that uh, the accused receives a fair trial. So you need to know who your friends and your enemies are. It's critical. This is where you find this out. So the goal is Always, as I'm going to reiterate on every one of these videos, the goal in jury selection is to strike the crazy people who won't follow the law and are against you. And then that's called striking them for cause. And you can strike others, what's known as a peremptory challenge. You can strike them because they're not going to be fair to you or you just don't like their attitude and they seem to already have decided that you're guilty, right? These are ways to be able to make sure that you can strike some of these people off. And that's the main purpose of jury selection. Um, you're usually not going to untrain someone with 20, 30 years worth of biases and prejudices against you. You just need to figure out what they are. So one of the things we're looking at here is I want to talk to you about how to handle criminal jury selection if you are facing a violent crime. Maybe you or a loved one has been charged with a violent crime and you did nothing wrong. Maybe instead you acted in self-defense. Now maybe you tried to do all you could to make that very clear to the police at the time that you were arrested for this offense that you didn't do anything wrong. And the problem is many jurors have a hard time understanding whether or not someone acted in self-defense or not. And they have a tendency to to want to believe the police that, hey, if you're arrested for this, you had to have done something wrong, right? And so it's really important that we help a jury understand that what your actions were, were self-defense. So how do we help them believe that? Now, how do you put the jurors in the place of the accused? And this is what you got to do. To help them believe what happened to you, you have to put them in your place so that they can empathize with you and relate to you. That makes you more believable and it makes you more credible. So how do you get them to believe that you acted in self-defense? I want to dive into a few questions and some examples of ways that our law firm has used jury selection to help make the jury believe and see things from a different perspective. It's a combination, and here's what that combination is, just to give you some context. It's a combination of educating the jury on the law of self-defense and then also putting those jurors in the place of our client or of the accused to help them relate to them and believe it. So number one, you do have to educate them on the law of self-defense. But in the process of it, you also help put those jurors in the shoes of the accused. And I know some attorneys say you're not supposed to do that. I get it. The reality of it is, though, if you do it the right way and you ask the right questions and you're artful about it, there's nothing wrong with helping a jury empathize, a potential jury, a jury pool empathize with the accused so that they can give them a fair trial. So how do you put the jurors in the place of the accused? How do you get them to believe that? Well, there's a few things that we have here. Number one, what are our goals? I'm going to give you four main things that are goals in jury selection when we're representing someone with a violent crime. Number one, we want them to believe them to be innocent. So this is really important. We cover the concept of presumption of innocence. I have a video on this as part of our um, jury selection series. I encourage you to go back and check that video out where a jury can believe that you're innocent. That's really important. That concept of presumption of innocence must be covered and be covered thoroughly to begin with, okay? Then number two, we want to apply the concept of proof beyond a reasonable doubt 
to a self-defense case. Now, that proof of uh, that this concept of proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the government must always prove. If you're the accused, you have no burden of proof. The government always has the burden of proof. I also have a video that I covered this. I encourage you to go back and take a look at that. We take that concept of the government's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We apply it to a self-defense uh, case. Okay, There, we want to tie those two things together. So that's number two. And then number three, we want to understand what the government must prove regarding self-defense. So now we have to tie the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt and the presumption of innocence to the exact elements of self-defense that must be proven by the state, by the government. Okay. And then finally, number four, we want to help the jury empathize with the accused so that they can relate and understand why our client or the accused acted the way that they did. Okay, it helps provide credibility to why someone did what they did. So these are really the four things that we're looking to do that are really important to help establish during jury selection. So let's walk through some of these questions. And the first thing we want to do, I'm going to give you some examples. We want to discover uh, the jurors that can conceive a situation in which they would do what our client did um, or and, and would want the result to be what happened with our client. So you must force the jurors, and you can do this in a very artful way, good criminal defense attorneys can do this, can help force the jurors to crawl into the, inside the skin of the accused and put themselves in that position. When you do this, number one, you humanize that individual. You humanize them so that, that it becomes a personal thing. It's a lot harder to judge someone when you humanize them and you make it, make it a personal action, okay? You're taking away the veneer of someone sitting in the place of the accused. They're just a regular person now making this decision just like you would be. And it helps put that individual, that, that jury, uh, the veneer is what they call them, it puts them in the position of looking at it just like your client had to look at it, just like the accused had to look at it. So it's really important that we do that. So let me give you some questions that we've done. Okay. Now, one of the questions we ask is, can you conceive of a situation in which you might take the life of another human being yourself? Tell me, Mr. Thomas, could you ever conceive of a situation where you would have to do that? And and one of the ways we do this, we say, are you married, sir? And we find someone that we get our list of jury questionnaires. We can see if someone's married or not. We'll ask them, are you married? Could you conceive of taking another person's life in a situation to protect your wife? And by the way, almost everyone's going to say yes to this. Almost everyone. And by the way, if they don't say yes, they say, no, I could never take someone's life even to protect my wife. Get them off the jury. I mean, that's just crazy. All right. They, if that's that type of person, they're not going to relate to anything that you did. Get them off the jury immediately. All right. Then we ask another person what they think about that. Mr. Hernandez, you heard what Mr. Thomas said. He could conceive of a situation where if someone was going to, going to attack his wife, that he would he would have to, if he had to take another person's life in order to prevent that from happening, he would do that. How do you feel about that? Use the word feel. Don't tell them to give an opinion. Ask them to you ask them their feelings about it. Share your thoughts, your feelings about that. That allows people to open up and be much more transparent. They share more information under that under that arrangement. And so we ask them how they would feel about that. Would you expect the law to prosecute you? Um, with a, and charge you with a crime if you protected yourself or your family? And we ask that question. We say, well, I mean, I don't know. I guess they could do that if maybe someone was confused about what happened, but I would hope not. I would hope that if that person acted to protect themselves or their family, that that, that officer would see that. Once again, what are we doing? We're very artfully helping the jury put themselves in the position of the defense and our argument that we're going to be making for the accused, where they're going to have a better feel for understanding, yeah, no, I, I would do that. And I would sure hope that the, the police would have done a better, better investigation to determine that that's what happened here. That's part of what we're doing when we work this. So then we go from there. Would you expect the law to understand your situation? Would you expect in the United States of America... Um, or whatever state you're in, you know, let's say the state of Texas or other types, whatever state you're in, would you expect a law would contemplate this situation and provide a remedy to protect someone who is innocent that acted in self-defense? And they would say, of course we do. I expect that. Now, if you shoot someone to protect another, Mr. Thomas, you mentioned this early, you would do that to protect your wife. If you were to shoot someone to protect another, do you realize you would be in the same situation that Ms. Jones is in right now? I said, well, yeah, I guess I would be. I guess I, I guess that's possible. I could be. Well, now, instead of seeing this person that's sitting next to me as the accused and this person who's the defendant who much has, must have done something wrong, now they're looking at it saying, man, I guess I could be sitting over there. I guess it's possible that it could be me sitting over there if I was just trying to protect my wife. 
I've never thought about it that way before. You can really get kind of a visceral response from these people and get a good reaction from them to determine if they are really relating to this individual, to the accused, or whether or not they're just like, no, I'm not, I'm not into this at all. I believe they did something wrong. I don't care what you say. And that helps you be able to get them removed from the jury. Now, would you feel like you might have to prove that you acted in self-defense? And this is a question I always ask because I'll say, let's say this situation came up. The police think you didn't act in self-defense. You know that you did. Do you think the law is going to expect you to have to prove you acted in self-defense? How many of you think you would have to prove your own self-defense? And I ask that question. And there will be people who will raise their hand. And I'll say, why is that, sir? Tell me. Tell me why you feel like you, that this person should have to prove their self-defense. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, and then they start trying to articulate it. They can't do a very good job. And what ends up happening is another juror says, no, that's not possible. How can you prove you acted in self-defense? I mean, I, what, what are you going to do? What if you don't, what if you, you did say what happened and what if the cop didn't believe you? How are you going to prove anything? Right. And that's a perfect segue into saying, because what most people will say is you're going to have to testify. The best way to prove that you did, that you acted in self-defense is you must testify and you'll have to get up there. That leads us into the fifth amendment privilege that exists for everyone in a jury trial that they do not have to testify. And in fact, there can be good reasons why someone would not testify. And that's when you get into that and you explain the risks of testifying and how people can misinterpret you. I have a whole video on this where I talk about the concept of remaining silent in a jury trial and that it cannot be held against you. But that really, you unpack that same and go back, I encourage you to watch that video in this same series where I unpack that in depth and I talk about those concepts. You would apply that in exactly this place right here. You would get into that in depth and that, and I talk about how important it is that if you get up there and you do everything you can to explain everything exactly the right way, you can still have people misinterpret you. You can still have people say, if he gets up there, I'm not going to believe what he says. He's just going to say what he has to, to cover his own hide. Or maybe he got a little nervous. Maybe he looked angry and I misinterpreted how he looked at these things. Or may, maybe it's possible that someone could misinterpret you when you got 12 people who are looking at you. So we get into all of that. And then I tell them, I say, you know, what then? What if someone did everything they could to explain themselves and you misinterpret them or another juror misinterprets them? What's then? Does that seem fair? Does that seem like an adequate standard under, the, under our Constitution in the United States? And they'll go, no, no. They feel uncomfortable about it. They don't know how to articulate it, but they, no, they're concerned about that. So it's a perfect segue when I say, what of the law that will be given to you by the judge that says every element and item of the case must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt by the government and every person charged with a crime in the United States is not required to prove anything? What of that? How do you feel about that, sir? And then we listen to what they have to say about that. I ask them, does the law seem fair? I like words like that where we talk about, is something fair? Does that seem unfair? Give me your feelings about it. You want, the more you talk in that type of language, more people are going to open up to you about their, th their feelings on it. Now, this is where things come in. It's really important. You've put that, the, juror, the jurors in the place of, your, of the client, of the accused. You've also made it clear to them that the burden of proof is always on the state. The government must always prove everything and that that's a fair thing to do. And now what you have to do is educate the jury on the law of self-defense. Did, what did you think, Mr. Juror, when you heard the prosecutor and the judge say that the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Ms. Jones did not act in self-defense? And this is really important. This is a critical element for self-defense that the burden of proof at no time shifts back to the defense. So this is really important. And a, and a, good, pro, a good defense attorney is going to really nail, you know, nail this down and don't let a prosecutor try to make it seem otherwise. Prosecutors have a really bad habit of trying to make it seem like they can shift the burden back over to the other side to have to prove something. One of the things we make perfectly clear is that the government must prove that the accused did not act in self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to prove a negative beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, when I say that to a jury, I'll say, what does that mean to you, sir? Can you explain to me what that means? And I want to hear some jurors try to articulate that back to me. Sometimes I'll get a juror, I'll get jurors that'll say, well, what that means to me is this prosecution is going to have to prove that what they did was so crazy it wasn't in self-defense. So I'm supposed to believe that unless they show me otherwise that what they did was self-defense. And boy, that's gold. Because if I hear somebody say that, I'll say, okay, that's thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Hernandez, what do you think about what Mr. Thomas said? 
Well, that sounds about right to me. Yeah, I believe that. Well, now it's not even me educating the jury. It's another juror educating another juror. And then I go, how many in here feel the same way as Miss Thomas, Miss, Miss Hernandez and Mr. Thomas? I'll get hands raising all over the place and say, is there anybody in here that disagrees? And I'll get somebody that says, well, I disagree. I'll tell you right now, I don't think it should be that way. And they'll start telling me these things. Well, this is wonderful. I'm hearing what people are saying. That guy who said he disagrees, he's gone. I can try to get him removed for cause if he's un unwilling to follow the law because the law says says the state must prove that element of self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. But here's where you educate that jury. And I ask them, does it seem fair that the government should prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you did not act in self-defense? And here's where I now empower jurors to act and fight for my client, fight for the accused. I'll say, what should you do if you get in the jury room and you're sitting around with 11 of your new best friends and, and they look at each other and they say, I'm confused. We've heard all this evidence. And I'm, I'm still not really sure what happened. I can't tell whether or not that guy acted in self-defense. I can't tell whether the so-called victim was actually a victim or if he was the aggressor. I can't really tell what happened here. I'll ask the jurors, if that, if that happens when you get back there and you start talking, what should you say? What should you do? You have a right to speak up. What are you going to talk about? Right? And I'll just sit back and wait for somebody to say something. And I'll end up having somebody that'll speak up and they'll say, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's somebody who may decide that they still think he did it. Um, or maybe I'll tell them that we probably shouldn't convict him because the state has the burden to prove the case. And I'll say, okay, well, what if someone does say that? Mr. Thomas, what if, Ms., what if someone else here on that jury, if you're on that jury and you got your other friends there and they, somebody pipes up and says, you know what? I don't know what happened either, but I'm going to tell you right now, I think he did something wrong and I think we ought to convict him. What should you say to that person? How should you respond to that individual? And I wait to hear what they're going to say. And we say, well, that doesn't seem right. Okay. Well, if it doesn't seem right, what would be the best way to make sure the law is followed? And I would sit there and listen to this jury, this juror begin to advocate for a, a client, for the accused who's sitting right next to me, where he is literally looking over at him saying, well, in that situation, that individual should be let go. They should be found not guilty. And I would tell him that he absolutely cannot be convicting someone when the government has not proven their burden beyond a reasonable doubt, because we're all confused about what actually happened. And then you go around the horn, you talk to all these jurors to make sure they have the same belief. And you can see if someone hesitates and they're not willing to do it, get them off the jury. They are not a good candidate for what's going on. But otherwise, you're educating them. And if someone says that they want to do that and they want to convict them, you're training the jurors how to fight for the accused. So remember the goal. First, the goal is to strike all the crazy people on the jury that will never believe you and they've already prejudged you. Then you can only do this, though, if people talk. If they start to talk and they open the mouth, then you can do this. Otherwise, you will strike the wrong people. Secondly, you must educate the jury on the law and make sure they will follow the law. If not, strike them as well. Thirdly, you must put them in the shoes of the accused. Put them in there so they can relate to the individual that's going through this horrible experience. They must be able to relate. If not, here's what's key. If they don't relate to the accused, they will see them as an object to be judged. And this is the problem with our criminal justice system. It's very easy for a juror to see the accused as an object made to be judged. Good criminal defense attorneys take away that whole concept. They make it very clear this is another person just like you. They put those individuals in the shoes of the accused, and it makes it much, much more difficult to judge someone in that situation if done properly. Good lawyers can crack the surface and have them see what was done as potentially reasonable. The moment they can relate to you, it's 10 times harder for them to judge you. So listen, I hope this was helpful to you. I, try, I wanted to give you some kind of the secret sauce, peek behind the, the scenes here and take a look at what good criminal defense attorneys do in a jury selection process to help make sure someone is treated fairly in a self-defense situation. So by the way, if you liked what you heard here today, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like this video, share this with someone else that you think might need it. And by the way, if you have any comments, don't hesitate to comment down in the comment section. I'm happy to answer any of those comments back for you as it relates and uh, interact with you if there's questions that you might have. I want to thank you for joining us here today. See you in our next video.